Well, good afternoon, everybody. How's the sound? Is that okay? Okay, cameraman? All right. Um, my understanding is that this is being recorded for posterity and for your viewing pleasure over and over again, <laughs> uh, or to let your colleagues who aren't here today uh, know about, about what we're talking about. So, um, b before we get started, I'd like to just get a sense of who's in the room. So, how many of you are faculty? Mostly faculty, okay. Graduate students or postdocs? Okay. Uh, staff? A couple of staff. Okay, great. And uh, of, th of those of you who are faculty, how many of you are in natural sciences departments? Okay, and how many of you are engineers? Uh, how many of you are neither of those? Okay. Humanities, social sciences? Medicine. Medicine, okay. Same. Same. Okay, great. Uh, well, w w th thank you again for coming, and it's a pleasure to be back. Um, I was reminded a, a few mi minutes ago that the last time I was here, I bravely stood here wearing a Nashville Predators t-shirt the whole time. <laughs> uh, and and, I, and I, I, I am back with my tail tucked between my legs on that. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to do today is I will uh, reprise some of what I told, uh, some of what I talked about last time in terms of describing the Fisk Vanderbilt Bridge Program as a model. Uh, and I'll share with you some of the data uh, behind why we built the program the way that we did and why we've structured it the way that we have. Uh, but then I'm going to uh, transition, and along the way we'll, you know, we'll do some interactive things. Uh, and then what I'll do is um, we'll take a little bit of time, we'll break up into some small groups. I have some discussion, some sort of thought questions for you that we can talk about. And then lastly, I will share with you some of the tools that we have put into our uh, bridge program toolkit that includes uh, tools for doing holistic admissions, uh, tools for uh, monitoring student progress in your programs, tools for uh, peer mentoring structure. I'll just sort of show you some of those tools and then point you to where you can access that toolkit from our website uh, afterward. Okay, how does that sound? Great. <coughs> Uh, by the way, this is um, a picture of me uh, and Shirley Malcolm from the AAAS. Some of you may know Shirley uh, and others. Um, several years ago, testifying before Congress about, about these sorts of issues. Um, and what I like about this picture is that not only was it a, a proud moment for me, you know, my mom has a copy of this picture on her bookshelf, uh, but also after testifying before Congress, no presentation again ever seems stressful. <laughs> so I, I highly recommend it if, <laughs> if you have the chance. <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, you know a major motivation of what we're talking about today is uh, the ongoing uh, and persistent underrepresentation of under uh, of, of minorities uh, and women in some disciplines, uh, in particular in the science and, and engineering fields. Uh, this is a a nice snapshot from this National Academies report, which I recommend, that really just captures in one view the steady attrition of underrepresented minorities here in Brown, starting from uh, the, the, the general U.S. population through to the college age population. Underrepresented minorities are now a little over a third of the college age population. So these are folks who are at a you know at an age and at a point where they are ready to enter the higher education system and are fully a third of our population by the time you get to science and engineering PhDs uh, we've whittled them down from a third of the uh, uh, of the population to um, uh, a handful of percent and now this is across all of science and engineering or what or what uh, the federal funding agencies sometimes refer to as stem fields uh, about six, seven percent representation uh, at the PhD level. Uh, but within STEM, there's, a, there's a quite a range. In the life sciences, a bit better representation. In the physical sciences and engineering, really quite, quite poor, even compared to the six percent. So here's a question. Okay. See if you can estimate. The average PhD program in physics, I'm going to pick on physics a lot because I'm a physicist. 
uh, graduates a black woman with a PhD, the average PhD program in the United States, average uh, graduates a black woman with a PhD in physics every how many years? How many think one year? How many think five years? Okay. How many think 10 years? How many think 15 years? <laughs> and how many think 20? Okay. <coughs> the answer is 20. The average physics PhD granting program in the United States goes 20 years between awarding a PhD to an African American woman. That gives you a sense of how isolating it is for an individual to move through a particular program, you know, who comes from some intersectional uh, underrepresented group. And it also just kind of, I think, just convey, you know, conveys where we're at, both in terms of how difficult the challenge has been, but also how big the opportunity is for making progress. So these are statistics from the American Institute of Physics. So here you can just see, for example, um, African Americans and Hispanic Americans constitute 1 to 2 percent of all PhDs in physics in the United States. And then here, as I just showed you, um, this now this is over the entire US in this five year period. Over five years in the entire country, there were 20 African American women who earned PhDs in physics. OK, so a lot of opportunity for progress. Let's, let's put it that way. All right, another question. Physical sciences, physics, chemistry, geosciences. What is the average PhD completion rate for physical sciences graduate programs in the United States? How many think 70%? How many think 60%? How many think 50%? 40? 30? OK. The answer is about 40%. <coughs> so, um, you might wonder, well, what, what does that have to do with what I just talked about, you know, every, you know 20 years for every, you know, on average for a, a, a black woman PhD? You, know, you would think that for as stringent as our graduate program admissions policies and processes are, for as much effort as we go to to screen and scrutinize applicants to our PhD programs in order to really winnow down the pool and select the very best and brightest, and on top of that, considering what it costs, how much we inve invest as institutions and programs into the training of each and every single one of those PhD students, you would think after all of that, that we would have some relatively high you know, metric uh, of having, in fact, selected the folks who are going to be most likely to persist and succeed. I don't know that we should expect 100% you know, ever with anything. But to me, when I first saw this statistic from the Council of Graduate Schools PhD completion study, 40%. You know, uh, think about how hard we work at graduate admissions. And after all that, I'm talking national averages here, but after all that, you could, you know, you'd, you'd actually do a little bit better just flipping a coin. So, yeah? Do, do you know of any breakdown as to the reasons the 60% are Maybe you're getting to that. Well, um, no, I'm not going to drill down into that. Um, the, the PhD completion, I'll, I'll recommend the Council of Graduate Schools publication uh, on the PhD completion study. Uh, it does get into some of those things. But we'll touch on it a bit. Um, I'm going to focus more on sort of the other side of that coin, no pun intended, um, which is, how can we do a better job of selecting the kinds of folks who end up in the 40% currently? So here's a, here's a, a, a slide sh uh, showing the, the actual uh, graph from the Council of Graduate School study. Um, and now I want to be clear, these are not statistics for underrepresented minorities alone. This is everybody. These are overall PhD completion rates in our programs, seven year completion rates, OK? Life sciences, it's about 50%. Um, engineering, about 48%. Physical sciences, about 40%. OK? <clears throat> so if you thought it was just the physicists, you know, the engineers are not a whole lot better. 
closer to a coin flip. Okay, so, you know, motivated by some of these statistics, in particular, the very low number of underrepresented minorities getting PhDs in the physical sciences and engineering in particular, and at the same time faced with the clear evidence that we're not necessarily doing the best job of selecting at the front end those individuals who will in fact persist and succeed long term through our programs. Uh, we developed the Fisk Vanderbilt Masters to PhD Bridge Program. This is a slide that I show when I um, visit places to recruit for the program. Um, feel free to send your students to us. Um, uh, Nash Nashville is a uh, beautiful and uh, vibrant city. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, um, the, our program uh, recruits students uh, with an emphasis on underrepresented uh, students who aspire to a PhD, who might not yet be ready to jump directly into a PhD program. Uh, and so we admit them initially into a two-year master's degree experience with a master's uh, thesis uh, requirement along the way. There's an opportunity during that initial two years, and we provide full funding support for the students all the way through. There's an opportunity during those first two years for students to fill in any gaps that they may have in their undergraduate preparation. Um, uh, it's not at all uncommon for us to admit students who went to a small liberal arts college, maybe they went to, a, to an HBCU, where the quality of the curriculum was very high, uh, or very good. Uh, but, but because of the size of the school, there may not have been the full suite of offerings uh, at the intermediate or advanced level that we like to see in our incoming students. So sometimes the gaps in undergraduate preparation are not a sign of previous poor performance as much as just not having had the opportunity to take some advanced level courses. So during the initial two-year master's experience, students have the opportunity to fill in any of those gaps. <coughs> Most importantly, the students are getting uh, immersed from day one into the research labs that they will hope to then continue in and join uh, as PhD students, and then seamlessly transition into the PhD program and finish out their PhD. Uh, so that's the basic idea, and that's the nature of the, the bridge. It involves Fisk University, our neighboring historically black university, uh, and Vanderbilt. <coughs> And uh, so we've been running this program for uh, about 13 years now. Um, 130 students have come into the program. 90% of them have been underrepresented minorities, all US citizens. About half of the students are women. And we have a better than 80% persistence to PhD. And I just want to pause there to say that, you know, we think now we have enough of a track record in terms of time and number of students to say that we're on to something, if nothing else, from the standpoint of selecting individuals who, in fact, are more likely than average to uh, persist. Uh, so Fisk has now become the top producer of African-American master's degrees in, in physics. Um, t uh, six years after starting the program, uh, we graduated our first PhD. Typical time to degree from starting the program to cro crossing the hooding ceremony for students in our program is about six years, <clears throat> which is about half a year longer than the average time to PhD for students who direct admit into our PhD programs. Uh, and, um, and, and now we've uh, graduated 30, 30 PhDs. Uh, the rest of these students are, are making satisfactory progress or on their way. Um, and um, of, these, of the students who persist and who complete their PhDs in our program, 100% are getting placed in postdocs. And then um, we, we've, we've now been going long enough that we have people entering the faculty ranks. <clears throat> so we're happy about those outcomes. So why did we partner with an historically black college? Um, well, the statistics, the data are that uh, HBCUs and other minority serving institutions are very important training grounds, in particular for underrepresented minorities in STEM disciplines. So if you ask, for example, what are the top 10 producers of African American baccalaureate degrees in physics in the United States? All 10 of the top 10 are historically black colleges. And 
uh, there's Fisk, uh, 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 just this list of 20 schools, 20 historically black colleges and universities, just 20 schools account for more than half of all of the African American physical sciences baccalaureate degrees in the United States. These tend to be small schools. Fisk, for example, has an undergraduate student body of about 900 students. It's not so uncommon. There, there are a few large state uh, uh, you know, you know, schools, um, historically black colleges, but mostly they're small, they serve a small uh, student body, uh, but it really gives you a sense of how much impact these institutions have on the landscape of higher education, that they are accounting for the majority of African Americans in STEM fields. So it's very important to cultivate partnerships with these places. Um, another important um, and, and very, uh, very influential uh, study for us <coughs> was this work done by Sheila Edwards Lang at the University of Washington um, about 10 years ago now. She looked at data from the National Survey of Earned Doctorates. I guess that's not written here. The National Survey of Earned Doctorates is the national database that captures all individuals who who pursue uh, doctoral study in the United States. So if you have a PhD, you are captured in the National Survey of Earned Doctorates. And what Sheila asked was, over this five-year period of time, there were 80,000 PhDs in science and engineering fields awarded in the United States. Uh, how did those 80,000 individuals get to their PhD was the question. And she broke it down by underrepresented minorities and, and, uh, and majority. And so um, what you see here are the different permutations for how you get from an undergraduate to a PhD. And what's really interesting are these right to most comparisons. The comparison on the right is what, for those of us in the natural sciences anyway, would, would, would call the traditional path to a PhD. This is you earn a bachelor's degree at institution A, you forego a master's degree, or maybe you earn a master's degree in passing, but it's not a terminal master's degree, um, and then you earn a PhD from institution B. Basically, one institutional transition, undergraduate to graduate. Uh, and what you see is that underrepresented minorities are underrepresented in that pathway where underrepresented minorities are overrepresented by about 50% is bachelor's degree at institution A, terminal master's degree at institution B, PhD at institution C. So additional transitions, additional opportunities to get lost in the cracks. To be clear, the people represented in this graph all got their PhDs. But it was really informative to us to realize that students on their own for decades have been utilizing, or at least attempting to utilize, the master's degree as a stepping stone to the PhD. So our master's PhD bridge program really just sort of formalizes that two-step process using the master's degree as a very intentional two-year training period um, and not just a kind of a pass-through, but really intentional training and mentoring period. <coughs> okay, let's talk about GREs now because I'm going to transition into talking about holistic approaches to admissions. This is a very important topic. Can I ask a question about the master's program? Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. So all of this started entirely with grant support. The very first students who came through the bridge program in 2004, I was my first year as an assistant professor. I had just gotten an NSF career grant. And I supported the first students with an NSF career grant. Going from there, we've recruited junior faculty worked with junior faculty to write winning career grant proposals. We've had almost a dozen NSF career awards to junior faculty who participate in the program as mentors. So that has been infusing some support. But then we got to a point where the program was large enough, I mean, you've seen 130 students in, that we couldn't just nickel and dime it like that. 
um, in a sustainable way. So now, we do continue to bring in grant support where we can, uh, but we've now really institutionalized the program. Uh, so FISC provides tuition waivers for all students who come through the bridge program pathway. FISC still has students who come in just for the terminal master's degree experience. They pay for that. That continues to be a revenue source for FISC. But for students who are pr participating in the bridge pathway, FISC waives that tuition. Um, and then uh, Vanderbilt has committed uh, from our provost's office uh, uh, fellowships to support the bridge students as they make the transition into the Vanderbilt PhD program. So in essence, we have institutional support for the students' first three years, the two years of the master's, their first year transitioning into the PhD program. And then for the rest of the way, the students are supported by their programs and, and faculty PIs in the usual way. Okay. So let's talk about GREs. Um, so according to the National Research Council, the median GRE quantitative score for physics PhD programs is, this is on the old 800 point scale, I know they changed the scale, but it doesn't matter. All right, how many people think the median GRE quantitative score for physics PhD programs is 800 on an 800 scale? 750. 700. 650. 600. Admitted. Yes, yeah, sorry, I should have been cl clear. Of admitted students. Yeah, I really need to add that word. Thanks for that clarification. Right. The median GRE score, quantitative GRE score, for students admitted to physics PhD programs is 750. I think I overheard somebody say it's not possible for the median to be 800. Actually, that's not true. Berkeley's physics PhD program, the admitted students have a median, not average, median GRE score of 800. Sorry? No. No, no. It, no, it just means that you have to have 51% at least having 800. Right. Yeah. Median, not mean. Median. Right? Okay? The point is, the point is that um, uh, uh, PhD programs are clearly, I mean, it's, it's evident, PhD programs are selecting students to admit in large part on the basis of this number because the, 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 the students who are being admitted have scores who are way, way at the, at the at one end of the distribution. Okay. So now, let's ask, in an average year, how many African Americans are there in the United States who score above 700 on the quantitative GRE? A thousand? Five hundred? A hundred? Fifty? Ten? Yes, physical, physical sciences. Yeah, physical, you know, students who are physical sciences majors <clears throat> and who are applying, uh, wh how many of them score above 700? So I just told you that the median physics program, sorry, the, that, that the typical physics program admits students with a median score of 750. So let's drop that down a little bit and ask, who, you know, who's scoring above 700? And the answer is about 10 a year. So I mean, I'm, the reason <clears throat> I'm going through this sort of step by step with you is that you, know, you have to understand that if you're going to apply a filter like this to your pool, a 
and where you're in essence aiming, whether you realize it or not, but in practice, if what you're aiming for is, an, is, a, is a median of 750, you know, the number of individuals who are even above the, the sort of the cutoff that you're in practice, whether you realize it or not, imposing, is already negligible. <clears throat> and everybody, Stan Stanford and Princeton and Harvard, are going after these 10 folks. So good luck, you know. But more importantly, those are not the only 10 people who stood in line to take the test, at least considering going to graduate school. <clears throat> so now let's ask, how many African Americans, um, uh, oh, sorry, you know, I'm going to skip that one because we sort of covered that one. This is what I want to ask. In an average year, how many African Americans who are physics majors, undergraduates, take the GRE? So I told you that in a typical year, there's 10 who score above 700. How many actually took it? 500? 250? 100? 50? Was there only 10? <laughs> so, you know, um, people don't take the GRE for the fun of it. And they certainly don't take it because, I mean, I suppose there are people who have so much disposable income that they just have nothing better to do. But, you know, it's expensive. It's stressful. Uh, uh, it takes time to study and prepare for. You know, these are people with physics, physical sciences undergraduate degrees. You're not random people. These are people who went to college, went through the college experience, went through the curriculum, have an undergraduate diploma, are at least thinking enough about graduate school that they're shelling out. By the way, the average cost for the GRE, if you consider both the general and the subject, and the typical number of programs that people apply for, I mean, you know, it, it pushes $1,000 of total cost for people. It's very expensive. So these people are seriously considering going to graduate school. And it's just not the case that there's not a pool of applicants. It's true that there's not a pool if you only consider individuals who, you know, who cross some very, very stringent threshold. That's your 10. But we've been throwing away <coughs> a whole lot of folks who at least are interested. So uh, Casey Miller, um, who was at Florida, is now at Rochester, and I published this in Nature a few years ago. Um, to, to me, this was, you know, this was really eye-opening. Um, you, know, ET, you know, ETS, the, the, the people who make the GRE exam, um, you know, are under no requirement to share their data. Uh, and so it was some effort to get these data. And I want to emphasize, because I know you're going to be wondering and you may ask, well, what about verbal GRE scores? Or what about subject GRE scores? Or what about this or the other thing? I don't know the answers to any of those questions, because these are the only data that we got. But with these data, we can look at what are the relationships between um, race, ethnicity, gender, and quantitative GRE score for students in different broad fields. <clears throat> And let's just stick with physical sciences, since we've been kind of running those numbers, OK? Um, and what this is showing you is, again, on the 800-point scale, what the interquartile range distributions uh, of scores are for test takers in each group. And the median score for test takers in each group are represented by the little tick marks. So think of these as little Gaussian or bell curve distributions. They're, they're actually not exactly Gaussian, but close enough. So if you look at gender, for example, in the physical sciences, uh, women score on average about 80 points lower than men on the quantitative GRE in the physical sciences. African Americans, Hispanics score about 200 points lower on average than whites and Asians. And 
the distributions, this is just a restating some of the numbers that we went through a minute ago, the distributions here are such that the, an African American with an undergraduate physical sciences degree who takes a quantitative GRE and scores in the 8th percentile nationally is within the, basically the one sigma of their, of their group distribution. Okay. <clears throat> um, the median test taker in that group is at 23rd percentile nationally. All right. So here is a line at 700. And so yes, there's a, you know, there's a three, four, five sigma tail that extends up all the way to 800, I suppose. But the point is that you know, if, you want, if you're looking for individuals who are going to be in that range that evidently many of our PhD programs are aiming for, you're looking for three, four, five sigma individuals <coughs> for that group. Uh, whereas for this group, you're looking for sort of one sigma individuals. You understand what I'm saying? OK. Um, so. Oh, uh, and so, uh, w w w no, well, let's just move on. Okay, so um, next question. GRE scores have been shown to correlate with long-term outcomes, such as PhD completion, research productivity, and scholarly citations. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that I, I think as faculty, when we're evaluating students for our programs, right, we're not actually evaluating people because we hope that they can do arithmetic, multiple choice arithmetic problems in 30 seconds. We do that because we think it's a proxy for something that we really care about, right? Are they going to make it through our program? Are they going to succeed long term uh, in, in long term measures that we care about, scholarly impact and what have you? Okay, so the question is, true or false, GRE scores have been shown to correlate with these things, these long term outcomes. True or false? Who thinks? False. Who thinks true? The answer is true. <laughs> the answer is true. Positively correlated. Positively correlated. Ah, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not tricking you like that. Positively correlated. <clears throat> okay, so now here is where I remind you. Uh, this is um, actually all disciplines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. G give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. So this is where I remind you that a correlation, a positive correlation, can be statistically significant because of a very large n, but, but weak. So now I'm going to ask you, what is the strength of that correlation? Let's just think st typical linear correlation coefficient, you know, little r. Okay. I've already told you that it's a statistically significant positive correlation. But is it 0.9? Is it 0.7? Is it 0.5? Is it 0.3? Is it 0.1? Who thinks 0.9? Who thinks 0.7? Who thinks 0.5? OK, 0.3, 0.1, yeah, 0.1. OK, all right? So the reason I do this is because um, you will read um, as I did in a, in a nature letter to, letter to the editor from the ETS people after we published our thing, GRE has been shown to, st to statistically significantly predict long-term outcomes such as PhD completion and scholarly impact. That is a true statement. Okay. What you then have to just sort of beg the question to find out is, how, how, how strong is that thing? Uh, and it turns out it's quite weak. So here is a, um, one of um, a, a, a number of meta-analyses that have been done, not only on GRE, but on other standardized tests. Um, and so here you see, for, um, for example, uh, degree completion, uh, the GRE has a correlation of about 0.2 on degree completion. In terms of citations and research productivity, it's more like 0.1 to 0.2. OK. Now, those are statistically significant correlations. Those are real correlations. The GRE does correlate positively with those things, but the correlation is very small. 
you understand what I'm saying? Here's the other thing that they don't tell you, but I'm going to tell you. These correlations, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, whatever, um, are residual correlations after you do a full multivariate analysis and you marginalize out the dominant correlations or you know, the nuisance correlations, right? The dominant correlation of GRE score is these two things. Okay? That correlation is way stronger than 0.1 or 0.2. Okay, so if you want to tease out the 0.1, 0 0.2 correlation, you have to first remove those other correlations, which are more like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 correlations. <coughs> yeah. I do what you're saying. Yeah, no, I do see what you're saying. Um, what I would say is that um, it is a very, let, let me restate your question because I understand what you're asking. It is a very difficult problem from a meta, from a meta analytic standpoint to really get at this because, you know, another, I think the way the psychometricians would say it is that you're dealing with a limited range problem, right? You know, you're trying to track pre, you know, pr predictiveness of long term outcomes, but the vast majority of PhD programs are not admitting people at the very low end of the range, right? So you're already grabbing a restricted part of the range and then looking for correlations in there. And so that, that is challenging. They can, you, know, you can do that if you have a large enough N and you sample you know, a large enough range of things. I will tell you that with 130 students now who have come into our bridge program, having been admitted with no, without regard at all to their GRE scores, but with the benefit after the fact of the knowledge of their GRE scores, we've actually run the analysis. Okay, it's an N of 130. But what I can tell you is that when we ask the question, is there a GRE score, if we had known their GRE score in advance, or if we had, if we had taken it into account, is there a GRE score, you know, even if it's a very low one, where if we had drawn the bar there, we would have made it more likely that we would have selected people who were going to persist versus not persist? And the answer is, we cannot yet identify out of 130 students a GRE score threshold low enough that it would more likely predict success than failure. And, uh, you know, and, and maybe that's not so surprising now when you look at these distributions. I mean, you know, you know, the, you know these are folks who have college degrees in physics or chemistry or whatever. And, uh, you know, eighth percentile national score is, is fully within the range for that group, right? And so, you know, and so anyway, uh, you might wonder, okay, well, maybe if you, if you only, uh, you know, if you draw the cutoff at fourth percentile, well, maybe now you do better. But anyway, now you're really starting to push it. The point is that these distributions are so skewed and so, so biased um, that, um, that you know, it, 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 other factors turn out to matter much more. So <clears throat> uh, th there's an astrophysics analogy that I like to use, but I think, I, I think y you all get it. Okay, so... Uh, so we decided to set aside GRE scores. Uh, we don't use GRE scores at all as a part of our admissions process. And um, um, and so you know th it was really interesting exercise. You know when you set aside an admissions criterion that you've used for so long, it, it kind of forces you to ask, well then what 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 are we going to use to evaluate? people. And, and then when you ask that question kind of afresh, that then forces you to ask, well, what, what is it that we're looking for? <laughs> and if, we, if we're clear about what we're looking for, then maybe we can be clear about what measures are most likely to predict those things, right? 
So we just kind of you know, went through an exercise. And what is it that we're looking for in people, right? And, and then you know, went, you know, went into the literature to see what we could find about what, what predicts you know, these kinds of things. And so we've ended up um, with uh, uh, an admissions process for our PhD programs that focus essentially on two things. One is what I would call basic academic preparation. Uh, and that's not just a code word for GPA, undergraduate GPA. What I mean is we look very carefully at applicants' undergraduate transcripts, try to get a sense of the trajectory that they took through their undergraduate experience. It's, it's quite common, for example, for students to have um, you know, you know, uh, started college, they fall flat on their face their freshman year. You know, we see D, you know, Ds and Fs sometimes in the freshman level courses. Um, but then what you see is that you know, they sort of, maybe they took a step back, maybe they try again, they kind of retooled, they kept going. They, you know, they got through those courses, they kept going. Maybe they hit some snags again along the way, but then they took a step back and they kept going. And you know, you, you know, you start to get a that's a very common sort of trajectory or nar narrative that we see in the transcripts. And the overall GPA as a result of that kind of trajectory might not as a number look particularly impressive. But, but what you start to see there is, okay, this person, they got through the program. They got the exposure to the curriculum that they needed to have. They got through it. And they really kind of, you know, muscled through along the way. Uh, so, um, and so that's fine. Uh, so that's you know, basic academic preparation. But then the other thing that, in essence, we have used to replace the GRE is this thing that in the psychology literature is sometimes referred to as growth mindset, sometimes it's referred to as grit, uh, sometimes it's referred, referred to as performance character or successful intelligence. These are measurable characteristics uh, that um, we sometimes regard as sort of soft skills or, I don't know, something like that, uh, but that, but that have been shown to be highly predictive of long-term outcomes so long as you're starting from a, a, a base of basic preparation. So um, um, Angela Duckworth at Penn uh, has uh, written quite a lot about this and done a lot of the basic research in this area, and I'm going to play you a little bit of her TED talk on this. Probably most of us can, uh, you know, sort of relate to that as a sentiment, but, you know, but how do you measure it, right? So, um, as a part of our toolkit that I mentioned, and, uh, and I'll sh uh, show you some more of the tools uh, in a minute, um, but I know some, some folks have to uh, leave maybe in a little bit, so I just want to make sure you see um, at the Fisk Vanderbilt Bridge Program website, you can access our entire toolkit online. Um, and, um, and a number of the tools, not all of them, but a number of them uh, have been published. For example, our, um, our grit or growth mindset um, uh, rubric uh, we published in the American Journal of Physics. So, it's, you know, so you can reference it, you can cite it as a, you know, a peer-reviewed published thing. Uh, but more importantly, you know, we have this toolkit available for you to use. So, Talking about this growth mindset or grit idea, in place of a GR, in place of GRE scores, what we do now is we um, uh, interview candidates to our programs, and uh, we have a pro we have an interview protocol by which I mean a set of guiding questions that the in that the faculty interviewers uh, use as a guide for the types of questions to ask. It looks like this, uh, but this is the rubric that we use to score the interview. And in essence, growth mindset or grit, based on our uh, review and discussion with researchers in the field, um, comes down to these seven facets. Uh, or these, this is how we've uh, decided to capture it. So um, you heard Angela talking about perseverance. Um, you know, so when it comes to perseverance, just as an example, we'll ask students will ask candidates to tell us about a time when they faced a difficult challenge or hurdle and how did they successfully navigate that challenge. One of the things that the literature on growth mindset tells us is that where traditionally with admissions, 
we've tended to focus almost exclusively on an individual's past success, successes. We've tended to overlook the importance of past experience with failure. Knowing how to fail, knowing how to pick back up and keep going, knowing what it is that you're aiming for that makes it worth your while to pick back up and keep going. That's a kind of a skill that if you come to graduate school armed with that set of skills, uh, it turns out you're much more likely to persist even when the going gets tough, and it will get tough. So that's perseverance. Um, you know, we talk about um, you know, uh, preference for long-term versus short-term goals. You know, so just as an example, we'll ask a student, you know, so why do you want a PhD? Not even why do you want a PhD in biomedical engineering or whatever, but why do you want a PhD? What is it that you're aiming for with your career and with your life? That getting the PhD is a necessary step, uh, and you know, how does it fit into your vision for your long-term plan? And it's amazing, you know, I mean, a lot of folks, um, you'll find out, are really sort of applying, uh, they may be perfectly smart and capable, but when you really drill down, are sort of, are sort of just sort of following their nose. They're not, really, they're not really sure why they're doing it, or maybe because the economy's bad, I don't know what. But, you know, what we're really teasing out is, who are the people who are going after this thing because they've got their eyes on an even more distant prize, and the PhD is going to get them there. That person's motivated to persist. And then we ask about you know, a realistic self-appraisal, for example. Uh, I'm not showing you examples of the questions for all of these, but we have them in the protocol. It turns out that an individual who has learned how to hear critical feedback with the mindset of, you know, this is how I grow and improve, that individual is much more mentorable and malleable and, you know, sort of shapeable toward a long-term successful outcome. Um, and not everybody comes armed with that skill of appraising themselves in realistic terms and hearing critical feedback and incorporating it as part of their path forward. Um, so, uh, so this has turned out to be a very, very important tool in our admissions process. Um, and um, GRE doesn't get at these things and the literature suggests these things are actually much more important and predictive, and um, the efficacy studies that have been done by Angela Duckworth and others on this kind of approach suggest that while there may still be some biases and correlations with things like race, gender, ethnicity, uh, in, in, in an approach like this, those biases or correlations are much, much less strong than they are with than they are with GRE, as I showed you. Okay, uh, so, um, you know, uh, our program has been written up in Nature. Um, um, the reason that Nature wrote up our program, by the way, is because uh, we had a student uh, come through uh, who, uh, as part of her dissertation, published a Nature uh, article, and we learned from the Nature editors that, that with that article, she became the first African-American woman ever to lead an astrophysics paper in Nature. Uh, she's now a professor at Penn State. Um, uh, the first black woman to get the PhD in physics from Yale came through our program. In some cases, the students come in, they do the master's part, and then they go to other, usually more highly ranked PhD programs. That's okay. Um, uh, the first member of the Sioux Nation to get an advanced physics degree is now a postdoc at a, a national lab. First native Hawaiian to get a, an NSF graduate research fellowship. She's now a postdoc at Caltech. Um, and I told you the, the overall statistics. So, you know, I, I highlight these just because, and we're very proud of these students, um, but it really just sort of shows, I mean, these are outcomes that we would want for all of our students. These students are not just surviving, they're really thriving. And, and this is the point in the story where I tell you that of the 130 students who applied to our program, almost without exception, those students came to our program uh, after having been turned away by every other PhD program that they had applied to. When we created our program, we did it with the intent of building capacity nationally. Okay. Uh, and so now in certain disciplines, for, for example in astronomy and astrophysics, our one program supplies approximately half of the underrepresented minority PhDs in, in, in the United States to underrepresented minorities. 
And that's in part because we're, you know, we're, we're drawing into this largely over, previously overlooked talent pool, but also because we're not simply trying to outcompete our peers. We're specifically recognizing that there has been overlooked talent and we're bringing those students in as new capacity. So we're very proud of that. Um, okay, so um, I'll just end here by saying that in addition to you know, how you evaluate people at, uh, at the front end, it also, of course, matters what you do to people once they're in your program. Um, and so we've developed tools in our toolkit for structuring, um, um, you know, networking, um, and um, sort of the lead up to the job market for students. Um, uh, uh, we have a toolkit for what we call a wraparound mentoring structure. So there are peer mentors, postdoctoral mentors, um, uh, and of course faculty advisors and staff. Um, we, um, uh, one of the things that you'll find in our toolkit, and if you're interested later, um, I can show you an example. We've developed a dashboard tool for tracking students as they progress through their programs. Um, um, but but with, with, a, with much more sort of intentionality than I think what we you know, often do. So for example, with the dashboard, we do uh, a, um, a once a month check-in. We have a, um, a steering committee of faculty who once a month go through the dashboard to see where each and every student in the program is in their progress, identify students who may need some additional support, who may be encountering some difficulty getting into a lab, who may need some, who may be at a point where they need some networking connections for that next job, right? So that's what I mean by sort of tracking progress and being very intentional about making sure that students get what they need when they need it at points along the way. And that dashboard tool just gives us a way as faculty of making sure that we don't overlook anybody and that we're paying attention to what their needs are at, at the right time. Okay, so um, I'll leave you with this. Um, again, this is the uh, web address to our website and then to the toolkit. Um, uh, I've tried to emphasize how important minority serving institutions are and developing partnerships with them if you can. Um, the master's degree can be utilized, I think, in creative ways as a stepping stone for many students. Um, the GRE and our over-reliance on it has been a real problem. Um, and we now have other more holistic uh, uh, approaches um, that, that can be used. Um, and then I didn't say much about it, but again, mentoring is also very important and um, happy for you to access our tools on that front as well. So I'll stop there. Um, depending on how much time there is and how, what you would like to do here, um, I had a, a short small group activity that we can do, but I, I will follow your lead here. Oh, I think about 10 minutes, but... So what do you want to take? Do you want to take a shot at the activity? Have we do it? Everybody? Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so just before we transition to the activity, again, it's just a brief thing, just to get you thinking about some things. Maybe just see if there are questions about yes. what I presented or... Um, yeah. Maybe to the toolkit, but I, want, I wondered about the actual physics experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me just, I'll just show you some of the tools that you'll find in the toolkit. Um, so for example, you know, we think about the overall, the overall end-to-end -end experience of a student kind of in these terms. Um, so in terms of mentoring, um, you know, there's the peer mentoring part. There's um, what we refer to as the bridge, pla bridge path planning. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Um, the transition to the PhD and then and so on. Um, and so, um, 
Okay. All right. So this is showing you, um, this is what we call our checkpoint timeline as a program. So this is for the first year of the master's degree. Um, now, as you might imagine, the sort of the, um, the number of checkpoints and the various types of sort of interventions and strategies uh, are, are much more intense toward the beginning, right? By the time the students get to be a fourth year PhD student, we don't have to do quite, you know, quite so much. Um, just to say that you know, you know, every semester for six years doesn't look like this. But this is what the first year looks like. So um, prior to the first semester, we bring the students in a month early for um, a, a boot camp. And so during that boot camp, we, we, we cover some um, basics uh, that we think most students will benefit from. We do a, you know, a, a calculus review, basic statistics, um, uh, basic uh, computer programming, um, a, few, a handful of things that, that faculty have decided to create short, you know, week-long modules around. But, but from the standpoint of the student's progress, the most important thing that we do during that boot camp is a skills assessment. Uh, and so that is, and so that depends, we, we, you know, we have skills assessment tests for all the different disciplines. And we now have tracks in astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology, material science, computer science, biomedical engineering, psychology. Uh, and so the idea with the skills assessment test is that, you know, we've already admitted the student. And by the way, I should have said our, our admissions yield is 100%. Maybe it's 99%. But, you know, as I told you, I mean, we, you know, we're, we're bringing students in who almost without exception you know, have been turned down everywhere else. Our application deadline is April 15th, specifically so that those students who have been turned down by everybody can say, okay, That's right? So we're evaluating them on their potential. We offer them admission. They all say, okay, I'm coming. Um, and then um, having admitted them, now the question with the skills assessment test is, right, this is now a low stakes thing from the standpoint of the student, right? This is not, are you in or out? You're already in. The question now is, where should we place you in the curriculum at the very beginning so that you, you know, so that you, uh, you know, hit the ground running so that we're on-ramping you toward the PhD program, but starting from where you're at, right? So we have a skills assessment test in physics. We have one in uh, chemistry, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and then going into the fall semester, um, uh, about halfway through the semester, we check in with all of the faculty who are uh, teaching the students in their various courses. We know every single course that every single student is taking because we did the, the, the curriculum placement exercise with them. And we ask the faculty, how are they doing? How are they progressing? We do an e-poster session where each student in their first semester prepares a poster as if they were going to a conference and then they just put it up on the screen and they have 10 minutes to talk about it. Generally, they don't know much about what they're talking about, but it's at least an opportunity for us to know that they've connected with a lab, they've at least gone to group meeting enough times to get a sense of sort of what the lab even works on, what kind of research questions are being asked, right? It's, it's really a, just a way for us to make sure that the bridge path is taking shape for them. Um, and then in the spring semester, you see this bridge path meeting. And that's where we get very intentional with the student about what is their PhD pathway going to look like? Whose lab at Vanderbilt do you want to end up in? And so, you know, or let's come up with two or three that appear to be of interest with you. And now let's set up meetings with those faculty. Let's get you attending their group meetings. Um, depending on the discipline, let's set up a lab rotation for you, right? Very intentional about making sure that the students are progressing toward that goal that they have. 
So all of this is built into the timeline, you see, and I'm not going through everything. But maybe that was a bit of a nitty-gritty explanation for what you were asking. But again, you'll find these things in the toolkit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, sure. I'll tell you what. Let's do this. Um, uh, you know, um, we can maybe just, instead of actually <laughs> doing it, we can just sort of, I can just sort of show you. So, you know, I, I, I have found that it just, it's helpful to kind of think about these, these uh, questions um, in light of everything that, that we've talked about today. So one is, you know, if you think about, you know, as faculty, this is, this is really directed at faculty now. If you think about who are the very best students that you've had over the years, come through your labs or come through your department, even if they weren't your own students, um, what would you say in retrospect were their most important qualities? You know, what are, some of the, what are some of the characteristics or qualities of those very best students? And, and what of the things that were in their admissions files when you were evaluating them for admission you know, map onto those qualities that you would say were so important? Um, and, you know, I, we, we, we won't you know, do it here, but, you know, think about that. Just think about that. Um, my experience is that most faculty who have been around the block, you know, a couple of times and have worked with a number of students will generally say, you know, there really is something about that perseverance, um, that sense of orientation, uh, that long-term goal, that persistence through difficulty, you know, uh, and, you know and, and maybe there are ways to teach these things. I actually have been following the, the growth mindset literature, wondering whether there are ways that we might structure activities for our junior graduate students to convey some of these skills. Uh, it's not clear to, it's actually not clear from the research literature whether you can just sort of, you know, do a workshop and teach people perseverance or teach, you know, right? Um, but the point is that if you think about, uh, with most of my colleagues, most people would say those are really pretty important aspects of the people who have come through and really, not just made it, but, mm, but really, really hit it out of the park. Um, Conversely, I think it's also important to ask the question, if only because we tend to forget, right? You know about affirmation bias, right? You sort of, you tend to remember the things that conform with your um, preconceptions and forget the ones that are negatory. Um, but, you know, about half, nationally, about half of the students that we're admitting to our PhD programs don't finish. So think back as a faculty member. You've all, we've all had them. You may have had them in your own lab. Certainly you've had them in your program. Students who, when they were admitted, it was like, oh, I mean, you admitted them, right? You were sure that, I mean, their application file really suggested that they were going to really walk on water. And then what, you know, two years later, three years later, something happened, right? What was it? And what might you have been able to do that you didn't do at the front end to try to detect that that was going to happen. I'll tell you, one of the things that has required the most discipline, probably the single thing that's required the most discipline for us as, as, as PhD programs at Vanderbilt, as we've implemented these holistic admissions processes, is to not just be doing the interviews uh, and the grit, you know, whatever, um, uh, you know, with students who we might not otherwise have admitted, but to also do it and to hold true with it to those students who we might otherwise have admitted. I'll tell you, I'm, I have now seen it happen as we've rolled this out across our PhD programs. Students who in the past, oh, absolutely we're going to admit that person. But now we subject them to the interview process and in many cases, you realize, oh, we dodged a bullet there. You know, we would have admitted that person, but they're one of the people who would not have survived. Um, so that, that's, that's, you know, the other side of that coin is important, too. And then lastly, you know, this is now for, you know, thinking at the programmatic or institutional level, 
what are the ways in which some of the approaches that we've talked about today, uh, what are some of the ways that you might implement them in your own programs? And what are some of the challenges? I'll tell you right now that one of the, one of the biggest challenges to doing, for example, the interview process is, you know, for large programs that see a large volume of applications, it's just not practical to interview every applicant. Okay? Even with our relatively small programs, we don't interview every applicant. You know, we try to whittle down the applicant pool. You know, I told you, you know, who, who it is that's applying to our bridge program now. Even there, you know, we now have 120 or so applications a year, and we can admit maybe 15 students a year into our bridge program. So you know, we're very oversubscribed, and so we have to reduce the you know, we, we, we end up being able to interview maybe a third of the applicants. So you, you, know, you do have to, you know, in practice, whittle it down. What I will just offer to you maybe as a final closing piece of advice on this point is a strategy that we've used quite well with some of our high-volume application PhD programs is we say, go ahead and make your short list of candidates, the people that you would have in the past just admitted or offered admission to. Go ahead and do that the way you always did, but before you actually offer them the admission, do the interview stage. And then, in addition to that, once you've made that group of you know, top candidates, make another pass all the way down your spreadsheet. Maybe you sorted it by GRE score, that's fine. But go all the way down. Make sure that you're not overlooking some potentially qualified you know, women, underrepresented minorities, you know, other groups that basically just kind of got pushed down below the fold on your list. Make sure you don't overlook them. Grab a number of those and make sure you give them the, the interview opportunity. Right? So that's, you know, that can be a practical way of managing a large volume, giving a fair shake to some folks who otherwise may have been overlooked, but also holding yourself true to you know, tr trying to maintain some quality also on those people that traditionally you would have just admitted. Um, so I'll stop there and yeah. <laughs>